You like the vest? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, it's cold in my office on top of that. Uh, so we have some, uh, some things to talk about. Uh, firstly, uh, the teams. I need to register you guys this evening. Uh, so based on the information I have from Lazaro on who is registered and what I know, these are your tentative teams. Is everyone here registered? Uh, I just yeah. gave Lazaro my information. Yeah, today. you are, it's, it's, you're not in here, right? Uh, so, so I'll put you there on, on team four. But if we can make team five, that would be even amazing. Yeah. You, sir? Are you going to register? Uh, actually, not. No, no. I'm no. I'm going to pass on it. I'm kind of. I'm kind of very busy with other things, so I don't really have time to. Do All it. you have to do is devote the Saturday. One Saturday. One, one. Saturday. No pressure. Yeah. One. For one. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no, well, I guess yeah. You guys are just saying it's just one day. Well. And and you might even get a uh, one of the scholarships because all participants, I I give you some money. How's that? And food for and Saturday. Food. <laughs> money and food. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> What's your name? Hi. Yeah. Paulina. Oh, you're the you're Paulina yeah. there. Okay, good. Yeah. So you're already registered. What's your name? Felix. You're Felix. Okay. Okay, good. Uh, uh, so, any word from Daniela yet? Yeah. No. Yes, she confirmed it that she okay. is a participant. Also, we have Seraphin. Serafin and Alejandro. So, so looks like we're on our way to Team Five, then, yeah, right? Yeah. So let me put some names down. Who wants to be on this team with Felix and? Uh, oh, come on! All right. Uh, Felix and Daniela. Are, are, is it okay to put you down, uh, Alejandro? C can I put you down in, on Team Four? Yeah. So the other thing we have to talk about is some team names. Uh, what's your last name? Remind me. Uh, Vecchio. V-E-C-C-H-I-O. -E yeah. All right. So it looks like we might even have team five, which is great. Uh, so are these teams sound OK to you guys? Yeah? That's what it looks like, right? <laughs> so can we come up with better names, please? I, because I, I can't stand them. <laughs> yeah, so, uh, so let's change all the names. How's that? Let's start with, hey, what do you want to call yourself? Can we get a, until the end? Sorry? Can we get until the end of this slide? Meaning what? You want? Oh, okay. All right. Uh, fine. But give me some tentative thoughts. Uh, give me the first thing that comes to your head. Sapphire blue. Sapphire blue. Uh, well, panther tree. You mean like a binary tree, ternary tree, that kind of tree? <laughs> Panthers are also found in the Everglades. Uh, they are they are also found in. Uh, <laughs> binary. Binary tree. Oh, just binary. <laughs> Look, uh, I mean, you you've seen the names of the other teams. They're they're so much more. Imaginative, come on, not not just tree. Sorry? You've not you've not seen the other names. Uh, uh, well I I can I can locate some No, uh, definitely not. They had they had ten teams, they had to name each of them. Uh, let's see. Let me find you some team names. Yeah. Well, those are the uh, those are the uh, uh, 
less interesting ones. They, they've had some, you know, uh, uh, sometimes something to do with Euclid, Turing, E equals MC squared, uh, Euler, <laughs> Euler. Euler. <laughs> as in O I L E R. <laughs> okay, so you have something to think about while uh, uh, when when you're not focusing on what I have to say today. Uh, so give me some names, yeah. Uh, at least by by six o'clock, email it to me. Otherwise, you'll get these boring names. All right. The next thing is I need some volunteers for the competition. Uh, I, uh, I will be, uh, I probably need about 15 to 20 volunteers. These are people who are not competing. Okay. So if you're not competing, we're going to have to hire you as a volunteer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that was the biggest thing. I don't have a lot of time to practice. That's why I'm, yeah. You got that better. <laughs> So, uh, so if you can, uh, Lazaro, if you can help with yeah. uh, with uh, with that, uh, maybe send an email to to some of the other folks in the club. Uh, uh, you've been to the competition before, right? Some of you. So, well, actually, you've only been to the online one. You haven't been to the physical one. The physical one is way more exciting. There's uh, lots of excitement. Uh, then th there's this one room where there are 25 teams, and as the teams solve problems, they get balloons. Depending on which problem they solve, they get a different color balloon. So you'll know which team is, is just uh, hitting it out of the ballpark. Uh, uh, there's also a scoreboard at one end uh, that'll tell you uh, which problem is being solved, uh, A through whatever, right? Uh, and then there are the, the people who are, who are doing the, who, who are participating, some of them have printouts. And so they get, they send out uh, uh, things to print and these volunteers run and give them uh, things so that they can then decode their, debug their, their, uh, their, uh, their code. Uh, so the volunteers are quite helpful and then they also help with uh, snacks and uh, uh, some uh, some soda and water and that sort of thing. Uh, so there, I really need need these volunteers in order to get this going. And then at the end of it, uh, I do need help in cleaning up and, and getting the uh, getting things uh, organized. So if you can spread the word out to say, hey, well, if you want to be part of a really exciting competition, this is your chance, right? Okay, so I need volunteers, and the sooner uh, people email me, the better, yeah? Uh, so they don't even have to be computer science. They don't even have to be students. They're welcome to just come, come and help us. Um, do you think, so would that count for like volunteer hours for the honors college? I, I think it could, yeah. Right, I, yeah, I, I can definitely sign, sign papers saying, yeah, you, you spent X number of hours there. Yeah, okay. I've done that before. Uh, Right. So, so, um, so question. So this, this competition is all day Saturday? Well, it's five hours. So it typically goes from, uh, it's either 12 to 5 or 1 to 6. I can't quite remember. Oh, okay. okay. But, okay. but uh, the excitement starts in the morning. There is a practice session where you get to learn uh, what kind of environment you're going to be working with? How do you print things out? How do you, uh, what is the Java, if you are doing Java coding, then what kind of a Java environment you have? Because it's not necessarily the one that you're used to. Because you're not going to be working on your laptop, you're going to be working on an assigned desktop. And the three of you will have one, one monitor to work with. So you have to get used to the programming environment, okay? So that's part of the uh, part of what what happens in the morning. So between I think it's ten and eleven or nine and ten, I can't quite remember. Uh, there'll be 
uh, somebody like me will go out and, and say a few things to you, telling you a little bit about what happens, telling you where lunch is going to be, uh, and where how you print things out, et cetera, et cetera. Then you'll have a little practice session, and then we'll go off, get, get lunch, and then we'll come back and we'll jump straight into the competition. That's how it goes. So you're going to be busy from 10 a.m. to uh, then after 6 o'clock, there's the award ceremony, so it'll take up to 7, 7.30 by the time you get out. That's roughly what your day is going to look like that day. Uh, uh, and you'll also get dinner. Uh, well, we'll, we'll send you home with some food again. Right? Other questions? Because I'm, I'm, well, I'm actually thinking of possibly being a volunteer. Whatever, whatever. Uh, uh, Makes you happy. So what, is there one day or two days for the competition? One day. One day? Yeah. Uh, what time? Yeah, that's what I just described. Oh, sorry. Right? Yeah. So morning session, a little meeting, uh, the practice session so that you get used to the environment that you're working with, go for lunch, come back, you'll get locked up in a room, and you'll never be let out. Yeah, sorry, no, you'll be. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, you. Uh, uh, then you're after that. There'll be an awards comp uh, awards uh, event. Okay. Other questions? Yeah. Usually, there's at least one person from the previous year who's gone through these things and seen them. Some of you have been in the competition, but it wasn't the real thing, unfortunately. Uh, at least not the physical thing, right? OK, so next. Uh, so today I promised you something about three-dimensional computational geometry, and so that's, that's what I'm going to be talking about, OK? Uh, any, any other questions before I, I jump into this? OK, great. Uh, let's see. So uh, all of this comes from uh, the qualifier problem on avoiding asteroids. Asteroids, yeah. Um, so very quickly, uh, uh, this is that's the link to the problem. What you're told is that you you are in command of a spaceship, and you're trying to get to the base station. Uh, you know exactly your location. You know the location of the base station. All you have to do is to, is to point it in the right direction and fire your engines, and it'll get there. Uh, however, the bad news is that, that you have to pass through a field of, of asteroids. Right? And these asteroids are, uh, uh, you know their locations, you know their directions, and their they're, they're going in some, in some strange, uh, in, in different directions. There are quite a few of them. And your job is to figure out whether you're going to make it alive on the other end to the base station or not. The problem is that you don't know your speed. You don't know the speed of the asteroids. So it's possible that suddenly you might slow down. Suddenly you might speed up. You have no control over this. All you can do is, is figure out a direction. Nothing else is, is in your control. Uh, and same thing with the asteroids. You don't know their speeds. Their speeds may change. And, and, they are, uh, and they are, uh, uh, their shapes are a little strange. We can talk about this separately. So your job is to figure out if any of the asteroids are going to hit the spaceship, assuming that you go from your current location directly to the base station. So you can't take any detours because the, the, you can only fire your engine once, and you can only point in, a, in one direction, and that's it. Okay. So in the end, your job is that you're given two, two straight lines in three-dimensional space, and your job is to figure out whether these two straight lines intersect or not. Actually, it turns out it's a little bit more complicated because even if the uh, even if the two lines uh, come very close to each other, 
it's possible that because these asteroids are pretty big, they could hit the spaceship. So, so our job is going to be to figure out what's the shortest distance between the two three-dimensional lines. And uh, as, I've, uh, as I said last time, the easiest way to think of the 3D straight lines are, are as arms. So you're, you're given two of these straight lines, and your job is to figure out what's the, what's the closest distance between these two straight lines. Uh, and uh, so we have to start with some three-dimensional geometry. You have to kind of figure out how to specify these lines in three-dimensional space. And then we can talk about how to figure out the shortest distance between the lines. OK? Uh, and we're going to work with vector geometry. So most of this is, uh, is quite intuitive. Uh, so we're, uh, once you know about vectors, you can apply to any dimensional space that you want. So in this case, we are working with three-dimensional space it's actually really easy to extend it to whatever dimensional space you want. And you can also apply it to two-dimensional space if you want to. Okay? Uh, and by the way, if, if the shortest distance between these two lines is actually zero, then you know that these two lines actually intersect in space. Right? All right. Uh, in in two-dimensional space, uh, two lines will always intersect because lines are infinite objects. Uh, unless they are parallel to each other. Uh, but in three-dimensional space, that's not quite true. Uh, it's possible that two lines are not parallel and yet do not intersect. So a good example is, uh, are my two arms that you see here. Uh, uh, one of them might be, yeah, even though there's, they are not in parallel, they don't really intersect. Okay. Uh, so finding the shortest distance looks somewhat non-trivial. So let's first understand the basics before we, we apply the shortest distance idea. Okay. Uh, so we're going to start with points in three-dimensional space. Remember, a point in three-dimensional space is given by its x, y, and z coordinates. Right? So there are three axes. All three axes are perpendicular to each other, and those are your x, y, and z. Uh, 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 so any point can be written down as three coordinates, but you can also associate every point with a vector, and that's the vector that goes from the origin to that point. Wherever the origin is, wherever the point is, if you draw a vector going from, from the origin to that point, that's what's called as the position vector for that point. Okay? And we're going, to, we're, we're going to say that the position vector is going to be written down in exactly the same way as the coordinates. Okay? And you'll kind of understand why pretty soon. Uh, uh, so if the point is x, y, z, then the position vector will write that with angular braces and still call it x, y, and z. Okay? We'll use the same numbers to tell you what the directions are. So if y and z are both 0, then we know that, uh, that this is going to tell you that you're, you're directing a point from 0 to some point on the x-axis, right? Uh, things like that. So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, uh, however, in general, vectors are strange objects. You can, you can translate them wherever you want, as long as you keep them parallel. So uh, so the vector shown like this is exactly the same as a vector shown like this, as long as it's parallel. All we're doing is translating the vector. Okay? But a position vector is very specific because it goes from the origin to a certain point. So if the origin is over here, and if the point is over here, the position vector is going to be that. I should use a different color. Uh, in order to make that clear. So this is the origin, and this is the point P. And here, uh, we're going to call this as x, y, and z, which means along the x direction, uh, the, uh, so if I drop a perpendicular to the horizontal plane, it's going to look something like that. And, and this is its x-coordinate. Uh, this is its. Uh, 
sorry, I have to draw it like so. That is its x-coordinate, that is its y-coordinate, and somewhere here is the z-coordinate. Okay. Actually, I got that wrong. I should have had this as the x-coordinate. So this here is x, this here is y, and that here is z. Okay? That gives you this coordinate x, y, and z for this point. I know my picture is, is horrible, but I think you get the idea, right? Any questions so far? So position vector is always a vector that starts at the origin and ends at a specific point, okay? And we're going to, de de we're always going to no denote position vectors by, by angular braces. Now, a vector, as I said, can be translated in space to anywhere you want. It's still the same vector because a vector is determined by its direction and by its magnitude. And the magnitude is, is the same even when you translate it, and the direction still remains the same. Therefore, it's the same vector. However, position vectors are very specific, right? So this is just for us to understand things. Now, if I have a vector that goes from point P to point Q, that's not a position vector. How do I write this? So if the, if the vector goes from point, point P to point Q, and let's say point P has, has coordinates xp, yp, and zp. And point Q has coordinates x, xq, yq, and zq. Then this vector can, is, is going to be denoted as follows. I'm going to write it as a column vector because that's how you always write vectors, or at least one-dimensional vectors. And its magnitude is going to be given by xq minus xp, yq minus yp, and zq minus zp. Those are the three, uh, uh, those are its three projections along the three axes. All right, does that make sense? So over here, you have to take the destination coordinates and subtract out the source coordinates. That'll give you the dimension of the, of the vectors, okay? Or rather, it's dimension along the three axes, so to speak. Uh, so, so any vector that you, go, that you take from P to Q, you could write it in, in vector notation. But of course, this is not a position vector. It's a general vector. Now, this vector, even if you translate it here, it'll have exactly the same values. So it doesn't matter whether it goes from P to Q or from R to S. If it's in the, in the same direction and it have, if it has the same magnitude, you'll get exactly the same vector, okay? So those are your, your basics. Let's talk a little more, some more basics. So we've, we are going to write vectors as column vectors, just to make sure that uh, uh, that's the general practice. Okay, it's not necessary, but that's how we're gonna write this. So if I have any vector, I'm going to give its, its projection along the x-axis, its projection along the y-axis, and its projection along the z-axis. Those are gonna be your three values, and that'll tell you what the vector is gonna look like. Remember, in 2D space, in two dimensions, if I told you that the vector has x projection this and y projection that, then the vector is going to look like this. Because it's basically the addition of this vector plus that vector. It's a vector addition, right? So you tell, as long as you know how much the x projection is and the y projection is, you can figure out what that vector is going to look like. All right, so, so that tells us about vectors. 
Uh, but when we write it down, it's inconvenient to write column vectors. So we're going to generally write these as row vectors. And so we're going to transpose it. All of you know what a transpose of a, of a, of a matrix is. So transpose of, a, of, of the vector is basically the transpose of, of this column vector. So it becomes a row vector, right? So it's the same thing as before, except that we're writing it as, as a row vector. Uh, the, the magnitude of this vector is very easy to figure out. It's simply, it's, by the way, it's notation. You can either use double bars or single bars. It really doesn't matter. And we're going to write this as x u squared plus y u squared plus z u squared, the whole thing to the power square root. <coughs> right? So you take the three projections, square them, add them, and take the square root. That's, your, that's the size of your vector. Same thing happens in 2D space. The length of this guy is this squared plus this squared square root. right? So similar thing happens in 3D space. Fine? OK. So there are a few other nice properties. It's a good idea. So we're going to talk about cross product, well, it, it came a little too early. I haven't quite talked about cross product yet. So if you want to take two vectors and add them, it's very easy. You draw the two vectors. The second vector starts from the tail of the first, the head of the first vector, and you'll get the, the final vector quite easily. So vector addition, if I take P and Q, my sum is going to be P plus Q. So the two blue vectors add up to the red vector. And it's easy to see that this thing is commutative, which means the order doesn't really matter. If I add Q first and then P, I would go in a different direction, but I would end up at the same place, right? OK. I can also do scalar multiplication, which means I can multiply any of those vectors by 2. It simply becomes twice in magnitude, but it's in the same direction. All right, then a dot product is quite easy. If you take two vectors and you take the dot product, it's equivalent to multiplying the x, the, the x projections, multiplying the y projections and the, and the z projections, uh, and, and that's it, right? That's the dot product, which you can actually write as the magnitude of u times the magnitude of v times cos cosine of theta where theta is the angle between those two vectors. This also means that if the angle between the two vectors is 90, what do you get? You get a 0, because cosine of 90 is 0. If the angle between the two vectors is 0, then this becomes 1, and you simply get the product of the two magnitudes. These are all basic vector, vector things, right? So, so another way to think about a dot product, it's a good idea to see this picture here. Another way to think about the dot product of these two vectors is that it's the length of, the, of one of the vectors along the other vector multiplied by the other vector. Okay, But a dot product is a scalar value which means you're multiplying magnitudes, not the vector themselves. Okay, So you're multiplying uh, this second vector times the first vector projected along this vector. That's your dot product. OK? Any questions about this? OK, good. That brings us to cross product, which is a little bit strange because the cross product is not a scalar value, but it's another vector. The cross product of A and B is a third vector, but that vector is perpendicular to both A and B. So if A and B are on the plane, then the direction of, of A times A cross B is given by the right-hand rule. So A times B will come out of the board. In this case, we're drawing it strangely, so it goes up, right? Everyone OK with this? Yeah? Straightforward stuff, uh, but uh, you use the right-hand rule. Now, that only tells you what direction it's going at. But if you want the magnitude of this vector, 
the magnitude of the vector is the area of the parallelogram that it produces. And we talked about this when we, when we were discussing geometry some time ago. But the actual magnitude can also be written as u times v times sine theta. That's the magnitude. Over there, it was u times v times cosine of theta. Here, it's sine of theta. Fine? That one is a scalar. This one is a vector. That's what you need to know. Okay. All right, some more basics. We know that if we have two perpendicular vectors, cosine of 90 is 0, so the dot product is 0, right? Uh, the, but if you have cross product of two vectors where the angle is 0, again, you're going to get a 0 because sine, sine of 0 is 0, right? Well, it's actually the 0 vector. It's not 0, 0, right? Uh, now we're ready to talk about lines. So the question is, how am I going to represent lines? Remember, line is basically a collection of points, an infinite number of points. And they all have to sit on a, on a line in three-dimensional space, right? So how do I do this? So the first thing, we're going to actually use two things. In order to represent a line, I am going to, I'm going to pick a point on this line. And I'm going to pick a direction or, or a vector that's parallel to this line. It may, of course, go this way or this way. They're both parallel. Both are fine. But by specifying the direction and a point, I would specify a line. That's all I need in order to specify a line. The problem is that if I only gave you the vector, it, this line could be anywhere, right? It only says that it's parallel. But in order to fix it in space, I need one point, right? And so that's why I need the point. If I only gave you the point, then I wouldn't know the direction, because uh, through one point, I can have many different lines that, that I, can, I can create, right? So I need both these pieces in order to specify the line. Clear? All right. So now, what we're saying is, if I gave you two different three-dimensional lines, your job is to tell me how close they come. What is the shortest distance between them? That's what the asteroid problem is, right? Are you with me so far? So I want the shortest distance between lines. By the way, before I do that, I did miss this particular one. Yeah, there was this cross product thingy. Uh, where did that go? Uh, uh, cross products, if you're doing w times v or v times w, you actually get the minus of the first vector because in one of them, you'll be going, the, going this way, and the other, you'll be going the other way, right? So it'll be either, either the vector or its, or its negation. So you have, to be, you have to watch out for that. In fact, we use that for the right turn, left turn question, right? Remember that? If you're multiplying by a scalar, uh, if one of the vectors gets multiplied by a scalar, the cross product only changes by, by that factor. It's easy. And it also satisfies what's called as the distribution law. So u times v plus w is the same as u cross v plus u cross w. Remember. Uh, this here is a vector. Addition of two vectors is a vector. When you take the cross product, you get another vector. When you take the cross product, you get a vector. When you take the cross product, you get a vector. When you add them up, you get another vector. So you're equating two vectors. And when you're equating two vectors, you're saying their x projection, the y projection, and the z projection are all exactly the same. Okay? All right. Okay, so. Let's now talk about shortest distance between lines. So we're going to assume that we are given two lines, and our job is to find the shortest distance between them. And now we know exactly how we're going to specify a line. We're going to, uh, I'm going to give you a point, and I'm, I'm going to say that's the direction. And that's all you need to know the rest of the line. 
fine. Okay, so uh, the one of the most important things of figuring out the shortest distance between two lines in 3D space is that the line segment that uh, corresponds to the shortest distance is a very special line segment in the sense that it's going to be perpendicular to both the lines. And this is something that's not so obvious. So what we're saying is, if I have one line that looks like this, and if the other line looks like that, and remember, it's not in 2D space. One is just this line. The other is some strange line that looks like that. So they're not intersecting. In order to figure out the shortest distance between them, it might be somewhere between here and here. Right? That may be where it comes closest. Any other pair of points is, is farther away than this. However, the nice thing is that when that happens, this is going to be perpendicular, and so is this. And I can't possibly draw this very clearly, but that's what happens. OK? And you may want to play that with two pens or two rulers. If you try and draw this, wherever it comes closest and you join them by a line, you'll see that it ends up being perpendicular to both these pens. Okay? And uh, unless you try it out yourself, it's going to be hard to convince yourself. Okay? Is that clear? That's right. Yeah. Well, in general, any kind of shortest distance will satisfy this perpendicularity rule. If I have a plane, let's say I have a plane. Uh, in, you can think of the floor, and let's say I take a point here, and if I ask you what's the closest point on this plane to this guy, it'll turn out that it has to be, uh, if I draw a line that's perpendicular to that plane, wherever it hits, that's going to be the closest point. Okay. Now if I take that plane and if I tilt it, okay, it's still going to satisfy the same thing, so let's say this is my plane now, okay? I have tilted it, and here's my point. The closest distance to this is also going to be a perpendicular thing. So this perpendicularity property is going to be satisfied anytime you talk about short closest path or shortest distance. That's the important uh, property. So we're going to exploit this. We're going to, see, we're going to use this very, very intimately, okay? All right, and then there is a second property that it satisfies, and that says that uh, that <coughs> uh, right. So uh, remember, in order to specify this line, I'm going to give you a point and a vector, right? Now. How does this help me to specify all the points on this line? Well, it turns out it's quite easy. If this point is P, and if this vector is U, okay, then remember, there is a origin somewhere here, right? And this point here has a position vector, right? So it turns out, let's call this position vector as p bar. So it turns out I can take any point here on this line. The position vector for this point, let's call it q. q is basically the sum of these two vectors. But what is this vector? It's not exactly u, but it's u that's stretched a little bit, right? So we're going to say q is p plus some stretched version of u. If my point is on the other side, this lambda will become negative. 
if lambda is zero, what happens? Q is basically P. So it's just telling you, yeah, that guy here. So essentially, every point on this line can be written down in this form. Okay, So that's what we are saying. With, it, with the help of a point and a vector, I can specify every point on this line. That's the same as saying I can specify the line. Is that clear? All right, great. So, so this is going to be an important, these two are important points. One is that any line can be written down as the sum of two vectors scaled with some arbitrary real number, which could be any number that's positive or negative. And when two straight lines come closest, the line segment that connects them of the smallest length is going to be perpendicular to both the lines. Okay? So, uh, yeah, over here, as I said, that lambda can be any number between minus infinity and plus infinity. And as you vary lambda, you'll get every point along this line. As lam when lambda is zero, you're right here. When lambda becomes positive, it starts to go this way. When lambda becomes negative, you start here and go this way. Right? So that's, the, that's what you need to know about uh, vector geometry and about the shortest segment connecting two lines. So now we are ready to tackle the problem. We know all the basics. We know all the the theory behind it. Let's see what we can do with the, with the actual problem. So the shortest distance between lines, we start with a line L. Okay, this is our line L. <coughs> and we know a point on it. Uh, I've called it A here, I'm sorry. And there's a vector U along this, this, this thing. And that helps me to write down every point on this line. So I can take an arbitrary point on this line. I can write it in terms of this point and this vector and a real number, right? Now, uh, I also have a second line. I'm going to call that M. That M has the same property, except that I have a different point here on this line, and I have a different vector parallel to it. Uh, so so I, I'm now assuming that I'm given as input two lines, each with one point on it, and each with a vector that tells me what are the directions of these lines. This is what's given to me as input. My job is to find the shortest distance between these two. Okay, so far? So we've now finally understood how to write down the input and output of this problem. Questions? All good? OK. So what we know is that the shortest segment from line L to line M, uh, let's assume it connects point P and point Q on these two lines. So I need to re redraw this, this picture and use the right notation. So let me use a different color. Here's one, and here's the other. Okay, these are two lines in three-dimensional space. I'm going to call this line as L, this line as M. I am going to say that the vector along this direction is U. The vector along this line is, is V. Sorry, what is it? V. I'm going to take two points on this. On L, I have point A. On, on M, I have point B, right? And I have said that the shortest distance connects point P with point Q. So P is on, on this guy, and Q is on this guy. This is what it looks like. OK? Once you find the shortest distance, if uh, the angle between them, we want this to be 90 for 
Correct. And so it has to be 90 over here as well as over here. So now the question really is, is finding those two points on both lines? That's right. Can we do that with binary searching? And so you can do that with binary searching, but binary searching requires us to know what the ends are, and we don't. Okay. So theoretically, yeah. Uh, in practice, not quite. And also, these are not integers. These are real numbers. So how much more are you going to keep dividing? Yeah. And so you'll only get approximate answers in general. Okay. So you don't want to do that. There are much simpler ways to do it, and that's what we're going to see now. Okay. Any other questions? OK, so, so the line PQ is perpendicular to, uh, so I can think of PQ as a vector, right? So this vector PQ is perpendicular to U and to V. This is what we are told, which means that the dot product of this vector and this vector is 0, right? And the dot product of this vector and this vector is also 0. These two will give us two equations. And you'll see that you can solve for whatever unknowns there are. Now, how many unknowns are there? This point has three coordinates, x, y, and z. This point has three coordinates, x, y, and z. So that makes it six unknowns. And we have only two equations. How the heck are we going to solve six variables, six unknowns with two equations? That's not really possible. So we have to do something else. And for that, we have to use the fact that we know A and B. We never used A and B. We're thinking of these as unknowns and using those vectors as the things that will create the equations. Once we use these, we'll see that our number of variables comes down. And we're going to use that other formula that said that uh, point P or the position vector for point P, remember the origin is somewhere, right? Uh, let's put the origin, I don't know, somewhere here. It doesn't matter where you put it. I'm just putting it in a place where it's convenient to see this. So the position vector of P is that vector. Right? The position vector of Q is that vector. And PQ is that vector. So these are all your vectors. And our job is to do something with them. Right? And we know that the dot product of perpendicular vectors has got to be 0. This is what we, what we know. So first of all, we're going to write down P in a nice way. We're going to say P is equal to A plus lambda times U. This is the unknown now. So what we've done is to, because we know everything about A, we know everything about U. So really, the coordinates of P has only one unknown. Same thing with Q. We're going to say it's equal to B plus, not lambda, but uh, let's call it mu times V. So now we have reduced P and Q to just two unknowns, lambda and mu. Everything else is our known quantities. And now when we plug it into the, into the perpendicular thing, uh, we know that PQ as a vector times a dot product with U has got to be 0. And same thing with PQ dot product with V has got to be 0. So we'll get two equations, two unknowns, and we'll be ready for, for, for a solution. Is that clear? We are given two lines. So we are given everything you need to know about these two lines. Oh, oh, OK. So you're saying, OK, so we do know them, then, basically. 
we are given two lines and we are asked what is the shortest distance between them. If you don't know the two lines, it could be anywhere. So that doesn't help us. Oh, okay. okay. So our problem is we are given two lines. We know exactly what they look like, but we need to find the shortest distance between them. We just don't know which point of one line is connected to which other point of one line to get that shortest distance. Oh, okay, okay. If we knew P and Q, all we have to do is to find the distance between two points in three-dimensional space. Do you know how to do this? You just do a square root of different squared, right? Very easy. So, uh, so once you know the coordinates of these things, you're done. There's really nothing more to do. It's just the distance between them. But in order to figure that out, we have to use the rest of the problem. So that's how we're going to go about this. Is this clear? Is the approach clear now? So we've now reduced the problem to two equations and two unknowns. And so now I'm going to show you an example so that all this becomes clear to you. Are we good with this? All right. Uh, so let's do an example. Uh, what do I have here? I have two lines, L and M. I am going to, so let's just translate it to the problem of spaceship and asteroids, right? So spaceship, let's say, is currently at 002. And let's say that the asteroid is currently at 1, 1, minus 1. These are three-dimensional coordinates. That's the current. So that corresponds to? A and B, right? Think of this as your spaceship. Think of this as the asteroid that's going to come after you. Now, the direction for your spaceship, we're going to write that as a vector. And because it's a vector, I'm going to do a transpose so that I can write it as a row vector. Clear? And the same thing with the asteroid. That's the direction of motion for the asteroid. OK, so this is what's given to you. Uh, the first two lines correspond to A and B. The second two lines correspond to U and V. Is that clear? OK, now we're going to figure out P and Q in terms of lambda and mu. How do I write this? Uh, So uh, your A is 0, 0, 2. B is 1, 1, minus 1, right? Uh, U is the, let me write U transpose as 0, 1, 1. And let me try write V transpose as 0, 1, 2. Is everyone comfortable with this? Remember, this here is a point, which is exactly the same as the position vector. If I write the position vector, I would write that as 0, 0, 2, but with angular braces. But it's, a, it's now a vector. This here is also a vector. It's a column vector, so I, I transpose it and write it as a row vector. Is that clear? Great, so this is the data that's given to you. Now, can we write P, uh, meaning the position vector of P, in terms of what we have here? We know that it's going to be A plus lambda times U, right? Remember, it's the vector for A, which is the same as 0, 0, 2. This is lambda times that. So really, this is going to be the, the column vector, right? Uh, 0 plus lambda times 0 is just 0. 0 plus lambda times 1 is lambda. And 2 plus lambda times 1 is lambda plus 2. That's what I get. Are we good? Uh, wait, maybe I'm doing oh, this okay. plus lambda times this. When I do lambda times this, I get 0, lambda, and lambda. Oh, okay. 
And then when I add it to this, I get 0, lambda, and lambda plus 2. Are we good? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sort of. Yeah. Sort of, yeah. <laughs> OK. So multiply this by lambda and add it to this. That's all. Very simple. Oh, OK, OK. Right? Q, on the other hand, is 1 plus lambda times this. So that's just 1. Uh, sorry, it won't be lambda. Now I have to use a different parameter, right? Different variable. Then I'll have 1 plus mu, or th I, I'm not sure what I use there. I have to look. And then, my, then I have minus 1 plus 2 mu. Let me see what I used. I may have used theta. Uh, yeah, sorry. I, <laughs> uh, I used completely different things. I, I, I apologize, but you'll get the same answer. So let's just do that. Make this theta, make this theta. Are we good? So instead of minus 1 plus 2 mu, I've written 2 mu minus 1, same thing. Instead of 1 plus mu, I've written mu plus 1. So I could rewrite this and make it consistent. All right? Yeah. The PQ vector yeah, right. is what we have to figure out. Yeah, yeah. How do we do this? I kind of told, told you this. If I want a vector from P to Q, here's P, here's Q, I want this vector. In order to figure that out, what do I do? I have to subtract, which you can also figure out by doing you can take an origin. This is the position vector for P. This is the position vector for Q. This plus this should give you this. So therefore, this is this minus this. That's it, right? Very simple, right? Because this is the position vector P. This is the position vector Q. This is the vector PQ. So therefore, PQ is Q minus P, right? Which is the same as saying you take the destination coordinates subtract the source coordinates, right? So therefore, PQ is quite simple to write. It's going to be this minus this. I don't have enough place to write that there, so I'm going to show you what this is. Oh, yeah, there you go. So PQ is 1 minus 0. That's the first coordinate, right? The second coordinate is mu plus 1 minus theta. That's mu minus theta plus 1, right? And then I have 2 mu minus 1 minus theta plus 2. That's 2 mu minus theta minus 3. Are we good? Yeah? And now we have to use these two equations that says you take this vector you do a dot product with vector u and with vector v, both should give you zeros. Now, we all know how to do dot products, right? I showed you on the previous slides. How do you do dot product? So you take, uh, take uh, corresponding coordinates, multiply them, and add them, right? Very, very simple. So. You take the, you apply those two equations, and then you solve for mu and q, mu and theta. So let's just do that by hand because I don't have it solved there. Okay. So what is p q? Oh, can I erase this now? Are we good? Yeah. Um, I guess another question is how do you find the the vector p q again? Yeah, I haven't done that yet, so I'll show you. So maybe I'll keep that for now. So PQ is simply the vector Q, position vector Q, minus the position vector P, which is the position vector Q is what I've written there. So that's 1 mu plus 1 and 2 mu minus 1, right? Minus 
that guy there, which is 0, theta, and theta plus 2. That's it. Good? When I do this, I get 1 minus 0 is 1. Mu plus 2 minus theta is mu minus theta plus 2. And this is going to be 2 mu minus theta minus 3, which is what I have written there. Right? Go ahead. P minus Q will give you a minus of PQ. So it'll just go in this direction, but it would still be perpendicular to U and V, so it doesn't matter which one you take. OK? It would still give you the same answers, and you can verify that by hand if you wish. Yeah? I think it wasn't in mu plus 1 instead of mu plus 2. Could be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you're right. And this also should be a one then. OK, good. So we know PQ. We know U, U and we know V. All we have to do is to write down these equations. And I hope you guys are already moving a couple steps ahead of me now. Right? And we get, oh, I, I erased U and V, sorry. Uh, let's see, U transpose is 0, 1, 1. Right? OK, good. So, so PQ dot with U is, you take that guy there, and you do 1 times 0 plus 1 times, 1 times mu minus theta plus 1 plus 1 times 2 mu minus theta minus 3. Right? That's your dot part. Good? We're just doing component-wise product and then adding them up. When I add this up, this is 0. It goes away. This becomes mu plus 2 mu. That's 3 mu. And then minus theta, minus theta would become minus 2 theta. And 1 minus 3 is going to be minus 2. And we're saying this is equal to 0. Right? The other equation, PQ times V, is going to give us that guy times that one there. So again, the first one is going to be 1 times 0. So it'll just go away, 1 times 0 plus mu minus theta plus 1 times 1 plus 2 mu minus theta minus 3 times 2. And this will give us, this will go away. Mu plus 2 mu will give you 3 mu minus, and so that will give you 2 theta. Sorry, sorry, yeah. sorry. No, I made a mistake. Yeah, so that should be 5 mu, right? And 1 and 2 is going to be 3. And then 1 minus 6 is going to be minus 5. So these are your two equations. Let me use the So now I have two linear equations and two unknowns. And you all know how to solve this, right? How do you solve two linear equations and two unknowns? You just have to multiply appropriate things, right? So you multiply this by 3, you multiply this by 5, and then subtract one from the other. 15 mu and 15 mu will cancel out. And you will get uh, 3 times minus 3 will give you minus 9 theta, uh, minus 15. And then you're subtracting this, so it's going to be plus 10 theta uh, plus 10. 
equal to 0. So you're going to get 10 minus 9, that's theta. And you can take this on the other side, and you'll get tau. So theta is 5. What is mu? I plug it in anywhere. This is 5. 5 times 3 is 15. 15 plus 5 is 20. So 5 mu is 20, so mu is 4. Are we good? Did I do something wrong? No. So I get minus 9 theta plus 10 theta. So that's theta. Oh, oh, right, because it's a subtraction. Minus 15 it's plus 10. I forgot it was a subtraction. Yeah, That's fine. I have to subtract, yeah. Did I get right? 4 is right? Yeah, sounds about right. Sounds about right? Yeah. Actually, now I don't believe myself. So let me see. I got negative 5 for theta. You got negative 5? <laughs> No, it should be plus 5, I, if any. Uh, so it's, uh, what did I do wrong? Let's see. So 3 times minus 5 will give you minus 15. Minus 15 plus 10. So that's minus, minus 5. It'll go on the other side and become plus 5. So it should be plus 5 again. Sorry. Not 4, 5. Did I get that right? So 5 times by 25. 25 minus 15, no. No, no, that's not right. So, so what the heck is going on? <laughs> Guys, help me. Sorry? Something is wrong here? <laughs> what? Negative 5 and? Negative 5 will give me minus 25. For, oh, 5 for this guy. I see. So negative 5 will give me plus 15, plus 15, uh, then minus 5, minus 5. That still doesn't make it 0. So something is not right. Sorry. What's the answer? Yeah, I did something wrong, clearly. So. So that's minus 9 theta minus 15. That part is correct. Uh, this should be plus 10 theta because I'm doing a subtraction. And plus 10, this part is correct. So theta is 5 is correct, right? OK. So let's say theta is 5. I don't think this is wrong. Now we plug it in here, and we get 5 mu minus 15 minus 5 equals 0. My, my thing was right. Mu is 4. 12 minus 2 is 10. This also is 10. Got it. I had it right. <laughs> OK. So what do we do with this? How is that useful? Who cares if theta is 5 and mu is 4? We can calculate what? Of what? OK, how do I do that? Right, so I plug in mu and theta. So I, I actually get the, get the vector PQ, right? So the vector PQ turns out to be 1. That's uh, which is 5 and which is 4. Mu is 4. 4 plus 1, 5 minus 5 is 0, right? 8 minus 5 minus 3. This also is 0. Wow. So very simple. The shortest distance is 1, right? Not only that, I can get the coordinates of P and Q now. I can tell you exactly where what it connects. So P is, I erased it now. Well, it's here. P is, uh, theta is 5, 0, 5, 7, right? 
And this is also 1, 5, 7. So 0, 5, 7 and 1, 5, 7, clearly the distance is 1. And you can verify that this is the closest. You can go play around with it and check for yourself. OK. So if the asteroid is bigger than one unit, it's going to crash. In, it might, it's very likely it'll crash into your spaceship, because that's how close it comes. Is that clear? Now, you have to figure out whether the asteroid has a radius that's bigger than 1. So for that, you're given the center of mass, and you're given all the, all the vertices. You just have to figure out if the farthest one is more than 1. Very simple, right? So you now have all the pieces in order to solve this problem, I think, except for one which I haven't quite told you. Is this clear? Pretty easy, right? No problem. It means they intersect. Well, then it'll it's going to ha crash head on. I mean, it's massive. <laughs> You're dead meat. <laughs> yeah. Center of mass is typically within the body. Okay. Your, your spaceship is minuscule. Your asteroid is humongous. Right. So all you care about is the center of mass of the ma asteroid. You, your spaceship is thought of as a point in space. Mm -hmm. And all you're checking is whether, whether these two lines come even remotely close. Okay. Right? Yeah. If it's zero, you have no chance. Uh, it'll all, you have to kind of rely on fate, you can watch yourself getting <laughs> crashed into by an asteroid. I see. Okay. Right? So we determine if it does have a magnitude. You can, you can determine that. Uh, uh, you can what? Like this one does, there's a line. There is a line, and it's of length one. Yeah, but if the asteroid is bigger than one unit, you're, you're still dead meat. So we have to calculate how big the asteroid is. Yeah. Okay. You have to calculate this particular asteroid, because each asteroid has its own shape and size. But it's easy to figure out, because you're given all the endpoints, all the vertices of the, of the asteroid. So with respect to that, so for each asteroid, we can do this calculation. So we can exactly. Uh, okay. Trivial, right? Yeah, well, you can code all of this into the program. Very, very simple. This is really, really not complicated. OK, what is it that's missing? All good? You can solve the asteroid problem? You remember the details of the problem? You don't care about hitting you at the same time. I mean, if you're dead, you're dead. <laughs> you just need one to hit. Yeah, uh, that's not the problem. What else? What could be the problem? You only found the intersection from the center. We are told that the asteroid is a convex shape. Yeah. So we actually want to know and it's spinning the twist end. Right. So we want to find the distance from the edges as well. Right. So uh, we I did describe that, and in fact, it may even be the next slide. Uh, so the avoiding for each asteroid, you find the shortest distance between the two paths, which is what we did right now. Find the radius of the asteroid, and then check if the radius is less than the shortest distance. OK? Uh, if it is less than the shortest distance, then it's not going to collide. If it is not, then it'll collide. So, uh, so uh, in order to find the radius, you, you take the center of mass to every vertex in the asteroid and find the largest one. So what else could be missing here? How is the spaceship given to you? Uh 
ฮะเอสเตชันเนี่ย so instead of giving you a line which is specified by a point and a vector now you are given a point and another point which is slightly different so how how are you going to deal with that Okay. That's right. So it needs a little bit of more work. Uh, you have to find the vector as the difference between the two points. That'll give you a vector, and you can use that as your u. So then you're all set. That's the L vector if we want to A. Right. Yeah. So if if this is your spaceship, and if that's your base station, let's call it B. Uh, well, we already have B. We've got to call it something else. Uh, let's call it uh, S. Then we're going to do the uh, S minus A will give you the vector U. Okay. So you don't care how big that vector U is. All you care about is for the vector to be parallel to the line. Okay. Is that clear? Okay. That's all there is, and I don't have anything else to show you. Uh, so if you have questions, I'm happy to answer anything you like. We have a couple weeks to go. Today is the 17th. 17th. So we have 24th, and that's it. Is it? No. Oh, yeah, that's it. So we have only one more week to go. What do you want to do next week? I think we're more or less done with the problems here, right? I don't think the rest were worth worth solving. Could, oh, could Go you ahead. Do alien numbers? Actually, I was looking at past uh, IPCC yeah. uh, problems. There was yeah. one that was really Deborah and I were trying to solve it. Uh huh. Uh, it was upper Timmy talk. Okay. Which was at the IPCC. You want to send me send me an email with the link? Uh, Maybe helping like overall competition strategies. Strategies. That's yeah. Good. Yeah, we can talk a little bit now. So overall strategies. Uh, how how do you jump into this, right? And we've talked about this last time. For all the others, this might be a useful thing. If you're a beginner, you want to sh you want to convince yourself. You want uh, and you want to satisfy your ego a little bit and not go back completely demoralized. Go find your easiest problem and solve it. That's one strategy. If each of you can solve two problems during five hours, you, you're going to be a pretty good team. I can assure you of that. With six problems solved between the three of you, you'll, be, you'll have a pretty decent rank. Okay? Uh, so, so set yourself a goal of solving two problems, whether they're easy or hard, doesn't matter. That's if you're a beginner. If you want to be competitive, if you have higher aspirations, if you want to compete seriously, then it's very important to solve the easy problems first. Why is that? Because of the way the scoring happens, right? You get, you get fewer penalty points for less time. If the first problem is solved at, at five minutes, second problem at 10 minutes, and third problem at 15 minutes, it's going to be 5 plus 10 plus 15. That's your penalty score. On the other hand, if someone else solves the same three problems at 5, 15, and 30, then their score is going to be much higher, meaning their penalty score is much higher. So there is benefit to solving the, f the easy problems first. And what you'll find is that there are all these crazy teams from wherever the heck they are from who will go and solve the first problem in, in less than three minutes. And you want to be able to compete with them in, in, a, in a reasonable way. So your first priority is to find that easiest problem, because that easiest problem is probably very trivial. OK? So go find that easy problem. And how do you find this thing? There are nine or 10 problems. How the heck are you going to find an easy problem and actually solve it and get it all done in three minutes? That's a challenge. So what you do is you divide the work 
and your each. So there are three of you. There are nine problems. Each of your uh, your job for each one of you is to you take the first three, you take the first three, next three, and you take the next three. And your job is to go and locate that super easy problem. That's your first priority in life. Okay. So your first one minute is nothing but finding that easiest problem. So you quickly go through it and, and figure this out. If, uh, most of the time you can spot it. Sometimes it, you can't. If you can't spot that easy problem, then you wait for somebody to solve that, that easy problem, and, and you know what that easy problem is. It'll show up on the board. You really don't want to be there. You want to be there first or, or early before anything shows up on the board. So that means your job, if you want to be competitive, is to go find that easy problem first. Typically, there are about two easy problems, maybe even three if you're lucky. So uh, if you divide the problems amongst yourself, there's a good chance that you will find the easy problem fairly quickly. If you're only looking at three problems, you can quickly look at this and, and figure out which one is the easy problem, okay? Because the easy problems, you should be able to solve that in your head pretty easily. So <clears throat> find the easy problem and go and, and now whoever is able to solve it doesn't mean this person is the one who can type the fastest and can code the fastest. So assign somebody on your team to do that typing for their first problem. Okay, so that first problem requires a team effort uh, where one person spots the problem, uh, the other, and maybe even writes it down very quickly, and the other person picks it up, types it, and, and debugs it and gets it in. That's the competitive part. After that comes the grind, where you, you figure out what you can solve. So let's assume that you've gotten two problems out of the way. These are the easiest problems. And now you have a couple problems on the board, or you're almost there with a couple problems. And now you want to figure out how to establish yourself as a, as a good competitive team. At this point, you, uh, in, in your, within your team, you decide what each of your expertise is. One of you takes on combinatorics, one of you takes on geometry, one of you takes on graphs. And you say, hey, here's a graph problem, go, this is yours. You, you give it to the person whom you think is, knows graphs, graph algorithms the best, and so on and so forth. So you quickly divide the problems amongst yourself, and then you, you go and work on those. Make sure you take on one problem and solve it yourself within, let's say, the first half hour to a one hour. Typically, there are moderate problems, which can be solved in about half hour to an hour. If you can solve two problems within the, the next, uh, whatever, two to three hours, you'll be in pretty good shape. You'll be very competitive, okay? That's what I would say. After that comes the hard problems. So somewhere about two, two and a half hours into the competition, you should be working on, on a hard problem that you can solve, uh, that you think you might be able to solve, that looks like, oh, maybe this is dynamic program. Maybe this is whatever. It's, it's just a minimum spanning tree type problem or something along those lines. Once you figure that in your head, you go and work out the details while someone else is debugging their program, their code, you write down on a piece of paper, the pseudocode, so that when your chance comes, you can go and type in quickly. Don't try to code as you type. This is a bad idea. <laughs> it's a recipe for making mistakes, and every mistake you make costs you 20, 20 penalty points. You want to avoid that as much as possible. So it's a good idea to spend a couple minutes writing things down uh, by, by hand put in as many details as possible, and then go and, and, and type in. If the monitor is free, nobody's doing it, go ahead and type in things that you already know. Uh, uh, for instance, maybe there's a routine for a dot product of vectors or something like this. You know you're gonna need it, go ahead and type it in uh, so that you can, you can 
uh, use it when the time comes. Uh, and then there is some strategy with regard to taking the right stuff with you. We'll talk about this on, on, on next Thursday. How's that sound? OK, useful? Yeah. yeah. So it needs some thinking, some strategy. Work with your team. Make sure you know who the team members are. You want me to show that again? Or you know your team members? All good? Sorry? Show me again. That's what I have. Uh, oh. So yeah, I just took the names from, from Lazarus list. Yeah. And I think that there are there are some more names here. Uh, whom did I forget? I forgot. Uh, well, I don't know if Michael's going to be joining. Most yeah. likely not. Seraphim yeah. and? Yeah. Alejandro is already yeah. there. Yeah. So, so if Seraphim comes in, he might be a standby for one of the teams. If we get two people, I'll, I'll enroll them. Uh, sound good? Okay, let's stop here.